Hello, Magic Community on YouTube. I'm T1 Glistener Elf, here with the first episode of a new series on this channel, Magic the Puzzling, where I try to solve Magic the Gathering puzzles. You can send me ones of your own, and I'll try to solve them myself. But first, we're going to try out one from Jordan Draper or Draper. Forgive me if I'm saying that incorrectly. He's picked up the Sphinx's Revelation column over at MTG Goldfish, wherein he sets out a scenario for you, gives you the cards you need to figure it out, and then lets you give it a shot. In the following article, he'll give you the answer, but if you'll stick around for just a moment, I actually have the answer for you. Before I walk you through the answer, though, go to the description, check out the article first, see if you can solve it for yourself. And if you're like me, set yourself a 30-second timer to see if you can figure it out. Once you have all the information, give yourself those 30. And the reason that I do that is because in an actual match, 30 seconds is about as long as you can reasonably expect before slow play gets called. A forgiving opponent might give you more than that, but at professional REL, it may not matter, so 30 seconds might be all that you get. Given that, see if you can solve it that quickly. If not, don't worry, I couldn't solve it that quickly myself. But give it a shot. In the meantime, cue the intermission music. So with that spoiler warning out of the way, let's begin. Here is the board altogether, here is your opponent's side, and here is your side. So when trying to solve these puzzles, the first thing that I do, if the goal is to just kill them with combat damage, is see how much I have on board right now. And unfortunately, in a sense, we have zero because of the opposing blockers. But assuming no blockers, we have three from the Dread Slaver, and two from the Scorn Villager that's about to transform. Five is not enough. Our opponent's at 24, 24 minus five. We have 19 points to make up. But don't worry. We can certainly, certainly do that. In fact, I'm going to show you that there's actually more than one way to solve this one. In either case, they start out the same way. It's important to note that you are still in upkeep right now, actually. The author notes that in response to Descendant's Path and Scorned Villager triggers going on the stack in that order. Now that's really consequential. That means that your Scorned Villager is going to transform first, and then Descendant's Path will resolve. When that happens, you will end up having a human, a druid, a werewolf, a zombie, and... What is that, a horror? Yeah, I can see that. All together, on the field. Now, in case you're thinking, well, what happens if we flip a land, or whatever the case may be, Jordan does note the cards remaining in either player's library will have no effect on the outcome. That is, the puzzle can be solved with exactly the given information. In other words, that should tell you something. He gave you that Grave Purge for a reason. Grave Purge, this kind of blew my mind at first because I didn't remember this. Grave Purge is an instant. What this means is that we can get back both the champion and the blood artist. Put them on top of the deck, draw one through Grave Purge, and draw the other as our regular draw. You're going to want to start then by casting Grave Purge, putting blood artist on top of champion of Lamholt. That means that you're going to draw the blood artist. Now since you're still in upkeep, Descendant's Path will finish resolving, which means that the champion, which of course is a human, which shares a creature type with one that you control, specifically Somberwald Sage, will come onto the field. After this, you're going to draw a card for your turn, but who cares? After all, according to Jordan himself, it doesn't really matter what we draw. We have everything that we need right here. Now, if we want to maximize combat damage, then we need to minimize the number of blockers on our opponent's side of the field. And of course, Champion of Lamhold helps us out there. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on Champion of Lamhold. Creatures with power less than Champion of Lamhold's power can't block creatures you control. Now, we can get this up to a 3-3 with just what we have in our hand. We have a Blood Artist, which of course we're going to cast, which means that we'll have used five mana so far. And then we're going to tap our Somberwald Sage using three mana from that in order to put out 
We'll fear Avenger. We don't have to do this right now, after all it does have flash, but we do want to do it. We also want to make sure that we don't tap our lands for mana for this particular creature, as we're going to need those in just a moment. Besides, Slumberworld Sage is a zero power creature. It's not going to do us much good there anyway, unless that card that we happened to draw was Crater Hoof Behemoth, in which case, well, why are we still doing this? But again, that last card that we drew doesn't really matter. We can do it with just what we know. Next, we need to take note of Dread Slaver's text. <sighs> Good grief if you played with this thing in draft. Uh, whenever a creature dealt damage by Dread Slaver this turn dies, return it to the battlefield under your control. Okay, that's awesome. That creature is a black zombie in addition to its other colors and types. That's going to be really consequential in just a bit. But what we care about right now is that if we kill something using damage from Dread Slaver, we get it. Well, lo and behold, I'm looking at you, zealous conscripts. That means that you're going to want to cast Prey Upon, targeting Dread Slaver, and having it fight Zealous Conscripts, which of course means that three damage will be marked on our Slaver, and Zealous Conscripts becomes ours. Now, when Zealous Conscript dies, it comes back under our control. That actually makes the third creature that's entered the battlefield under our control since Champion of Lamhold resolved, which means it's now a 4-4. And since Champion's a 4-4, and the creature with the greatest power on their side that's left is 3, that means that all of our creatures are now unblockable. Now, when Zealous Conscript's Enter the Battlefield trigger resolves, you actually have a choice. You can take one of two permanents, and either one will get you a win. It's simply a matter of would you rather take the easy way, or would you like to style out? The shortest path to victory is to take the Insectile Aberration. It, after all, will keep the Butcher's Cleaver on it and that means that it's a 6 power flyer. As a little bonus, it has lifelink, but we don't care about that. Although we do care that it is a human. We're about to in just a moment, anyway. From here, cast Revenge of the Hunted on one of your creatures that's about to attack. Dread Slaver, Moonscarred Werewolf, Zealous Conscripts, or Insectile Aberration. This means that in terms of combat damage, you'll end up doing 3 from the Dread Slaver, 2 from the Moonscarred Werewolf, 3 from the Zealous Conscripts, six from the Insectile Aberration, and six from whichever creature got Revenge of the Hunted put on it. Add it all up, and you get 20. 20 combat damage. But we're not done just yet. Note the number of humans that you have on the battlefield now. You have Champion of Lamholt, Somberwald Sage, Zealous Conscripts, and Insectile Aberration. Well, Fiend of Shadows cares about them being human. You sacrifice a human in order to regenerate her. This wouldn't really do anything for us, except Blood Artist is on the field. Yes, that means that we can sacrifice our four humans to drain them for exactly four to get them to lethal. From 24 life. But that's the easy way out. That's what I think that most people actually would see. There is another way that you can go about this, though, a fancier way. Check this out. If, instead of taking the Insectile Aberration with your Zealous Conscript into the battlefield trigger, you take... Fiend of the Shadows, you can actually do a little bit more. Now, that seems a little bit wrong, right? You're taking your own creature, but what we care about is that we're untapping it. That means that it can attack this turn. And lo and behold, look at what triggers when it deals combat damage to a player. That's right, we get to cast the one card that's left in their hand, Keswick Malcontents. And at first it looks like we shouldn't be able to. It doesn't let us cast it without paying the mana cost, we still have to do that. And while we have the Shimmering Grotto, that's not enough, is it? Actually, thanks to Moonscarred Werewolf having Vigilance and being able to produce Green Green, we tap the one land that we have left that's not Shimmering Grotto to, of course, shimmer into some red mana. And then we tap our Moonscarred Werewolf, and now, lo and behold, we have three mana. Since we didn't do quite as much damage during combat, after all, we traded a six power creature for a three power creature, we only dealt 17. Only dealt 17. Wow. However, lucky for us, Keswick Malcontents will deal 4 damage when it enters the battlefield. So your humans will be, itself of course, Zealous Conscripts, Somberwald Sage, and Champion of Lamholt. 17 plus 4, they're at 21. Now once again drain them with Fiend of Shadows, and... 25. We have dealt 25 to our opponent by going about it this way. So there you have it. 
Instead of drawing or outright losing, we win. That's the puzzle solved for you. I hope you were able to solve it first, but if not, I'm glad this was able to help, and I hope that you learned something. For one thing, here's something that not a lot of players know. When you take control of an equipped creature, that equipment stays on them. This insectile aberration wouldn't be able to deal 6 damage if not for this fact. The same is true of auras as well, although in the case of equipments, bear in mind that your opponent still controls it, and therefore when it comes back around to their turn, they can just equip it to a different creature. Anyway, that's it for this episode. If you have a link to a puzzle like this, feel more than free to send it to me, and I might very well do an episode on it. Otherwise, if you have your own scenario that you've made up, send it to me as well. That's it. Take care, YouTube. I will see you later. Bye-bye.